I think it's clear that everybody that's here at this conference has a relationship to quality um, in some way, right? NABCEP represents quality. And I think there's a, a, an important distinction to make in that NABCEP uh, really emphasizes quality in terms of tasks. Um, selling a system, designing a system, installing, commissioning, maintaining, those are all tasks that individuals are responsible for and that NABCEP trains those individuals to do very effectively. Uh, but a lot of the people in this room are not directly responsible for all those tasks. And as businesses grow, uh, people become responsible for people, or for teams, or for departments, or for enterprises, right? The, the scale of responsibility changes, and distance is created between the task and the responsibility for quality. And so what's really interesting to me, um, being a business person myself, is how, do the, how does the relationship to quality change at different scales in the development of a business? And what are the decisions and the choices in terms of strategy and organizational design that business leaders make as they're going through transitions from a one-person entrepreneur company to, in some cases, a 200-person-plus solar residential company. So in putting this panel together, uh, I talked with four companies that I've known for a long time. And uh, I want to introduce them all to you now, rather than interrupting the presentations along the way. Uh, we have Chad Waits from Net Zero Solar. Net Zero is a small residential contractor, some small commercial as well, based in Tucson, Arizona. There are about 10 people in the organization. Founded in 2008. There's something else I wanted to say about you, Chad. Oh, so, so in talking with Chad about preparing for this panel, one of the themes that came up that I think you'll hear from him today is the transition from doing selling himself as the owner of the business to having salespeople or a salesperson responsible for selling and how important that transition was and uh, how important it was to manage quality through that transition and how that was done. Um, as some of you probably know, in Arizona, there's a huge amount of market pressure too because of uh, utility rate design um, legislation that's passed. So that also creates more pressure for quality be to be looked at in different ways. After Chad, we have August Gers, who's the COO of Luminalt in San Francisco. Um, Luminalt is about 30 people established in about 2004. Um, they're known for being the largest residential installer in San Francisco, despite Solar City and Sunrun and Sungevity and Vivint and you name it. Uh, Luminalt is the largest residential installer in San Francisco, which is very cool. And one of the transitions that um, August and I talked about in preparing for the panel was uh, the transition from the owners of the company or the founders of the company being the primary managers to having a layer of management between them and the rest of the organization. Very important transition, um, especially in, in terms of uh, managing quality as it pertains to values, strategy, um, leadership, um, um, integrity, things like that. Then we're going to hear from Gary Gerber, um, who uh, I, I was kind of blown away to learn yesterday that he's been running one solar business contiguously since 1976, um, 41 years. Uh, Gary has learned an incredible amount about the kinds of transitions that we're talking about, including what happens when you scale down a business, um, which is what happened in 1985. Um, when, when Gary went from doing a lot of solar hot water to doing a lot of repair. So uh, Gary's company is right now around 60 people. A uh, company, by the way, is Sunlight and Power. Um, and they're moving towards 80 people this year. And um, one of the things that we talked about in preparing for this panel was the importance of uh, training and, and the, the expense of training and how to manage that expense and whether those capabilities manifest inside the company or external, um, things like that. So uh, I should emphasize 
Sunlight and Power now does mostly commercial solar. And then last, we're going to hear from Keith Randon, who's the uh, Director of Engineering for Baker Electric Solar, which I believe is the largest um, installation company in the San Diego area. Is that right? And one of the transitions that Baker is going through now, there are about 200 some people just in their residential division. Uh, one of their big transitions is moving towards regionalization. So they're starting to have more satellite offices uh, and that brings up all kinds of organizational questions, um, especially when it comes to, to quality and consistency across different locations. Um, but, so that's a huge transition. Um, and the, the focus that Baker brought to, to the talk um, was about brand management, which sounds like really different than what Chad and I talked about, but it's really not, right? Uh, for, for Baker to represent its brand in the way it intends to in the market, it has to be thinking about the same kinds of things that Chad is thinking about when he sends a salesperson out to close a deal instead of going out himself, right? How is my company being represented? So I loved that um, tying together that, that came up in the discussion with Baker. So I hope this panel is very valuable for you. I want to remind our panelists you have 20 minutes each because we want to leave ample time for Q&A at the end. I'm hoping there's a good discussion afterwards. And um, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, I think first of all, um, I just want to thank Boaz for including me in this. I feel like uh, David versus Goliath sometime out in the market. So it's it's uh, good for me to be able to sit up here and learn from these guys. And that's typically been my position every time I've come to these uh, NABSEP uh, conferences, is um, I'm here to soak up knowledge from people like you and like Boaz and, and these gentlemen up here. So it's a, it's a bit humbling um, to be up here. Um, I don't know how many of you got a chance to see Jeff Spee's presentation last night, but that's another reason why. <laughs> Um, there's just some fantastic people here that uh, are always willing to share their knowledge. So I uh, appreciate being invited here. So all right, just a little <coughs> brief snippet about me. Um, I started uh, my solar journey, getting paid for it uh, in 2002. Um, really uh, was inspired to get a NABSEP certification in about 2004. I think that was the first test cycle, but I didn't have enough experience and uh, certainly didn't feel like I had the knowledge base yet. So I, I deferred to 2007 and then for PV certification and then uh, solar hot water in, in uh, 2010. So I opened my business in 2008 uh, after feeling like I had you know, cut my teeth long enough working for other people and learning what to do and more importantly, what not to do. Um, so we do, you know, small residential stuff and small commercial grid tie off grid, some water pumping, um, and we really kind of uh, like to go those other ways uh, to keep it kind of fresh for myself and for uh, my teammates as well. So obviously the off grid and the water pumping stuff is, uh, you know, can be uh, a little tricky and has certain nuances that you need to be paying close attention to. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, in a whole load of trouble. So we got ten. 10 people plus myself. Um, most of these people have been with me uh, gradually since I opened the company in 2008. I still have the first two uh, employees, if you want to call them that, teammates. So uh, just briefly before I start to get on my topics, you know, why an upset for me? Um, you know, I got in this business uh, because I really wanted to uh, be respected uh, in what I do. And I put a lot of passion into uh, continually working on quality, uh, and NAPSEP just seemed to fit that really well for me personally. Um, you know, uh, and I think you'll see this kind of overarching theme to um, the way we, I run my business is that, um, you know, there's a, there's a trade-off for me in terms of being happy professionally and being happy personally, and I wanted to find that happy balance. Um, and, um, you know, that uh, really has uh, helped us uh, shape the, the, the direction of the company. Um, you know, where is the value in NAPSEP for my company? It's uh, certainly, it helps us be critical of our processes and it helps us continually refine them. Um, just kind of holding ourselves to a higher standard and always looking back at 
you know, the work that we've done and uh, how to make that better. And our guys really know our commitment to quality because they see it every day and uh, our continuing commitment to the NABCEP education and CEUs, you know, coming here and making ourselves are, are learning more. And, uh, you know, we really feel like, or I really feel like we use NABCEP as our moral business compass, you know. How is this uh, going to look in 20 years really is, um, you know, something that's pretty valuable to us in terms of shaping, um, you know, the product that we put out there. So the, the main topics um, that I wanted to talk about is, you know, making that transition from the owner who does the sales to, to passing that off to, uh, to a salesperson. Um, that's a huge, that was a huge thing for me in terms of letting it go. Because I really don't feel like, or I didn't feel like, there was anyone else out there that can kind of articulate that value proposition um, that someone who's obviously invested in the company could do. Plus, there was, a, you know, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge there um, over those years that you gather that, um, you know, is difficult for a salesperson to just pick up and, and run with. I just wanted to see a real quick show of hands for, for the business owners here, people who are actually running installation companies. Oh yeah, quite a few of them, sweet. And how many of you are basically our size, 10 to 12 people and, and under? Great, all right. So um, you guys can really, I'm sure, appreciate uh, that uh, trepidation and handing off your business <laughs> to someone that uh, may have been selling cell phones or stereos or something else, you know, a couple weeks prior. So um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah. The, uh, so one of the things that I really uh, felt like um, was going to be a huge or very important part of that process was making sure that person was trained because our model is such that we don't have an engineering visit uh, after we do the sales. Um, you know, we gather all of that electrical information, all the structural information, basically all of the preliminary design is done right there. Um, so. You know, I, I didn't realize how much information that was until the very first day I went out with Brian, my sales guy, and it was a ground mount installation with a service panel upgrade, a long distance run, and, and I started to articulate all this stuff vocally because I, normally it's just going on in my head to him, and I'm like, damn, there is a lot of information that this poor guy is gonna have to pick up before I can cut him loose. So. You know, this process is still ongoing. I hired Brian in May of last year, and uh, not until just recently did I really feel like I could cut him loose to go out and, you know, actually do a sales proposal on his own. So training, 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 and then, you know, really uh, focusing on that intake, that uh, job um, uh, scope uh, of work intake. So. Um, being very clear with him about the information that needed to be gathered uh, on the front end and giving him the tools really to, uh, to kind of fall back on in case he felt like he missed something. So, um, you know, I think uh, one of the other things that's really uh, I've grappled with, and Brian has made it pretty easy for me, is that compensation model for salespeople. Um, and I'd be interested to talk to some of you smaller business owners about uh, what's, what's working for you. But um, Brian and I came to the conclusion that, uh, and this was mostly driven by him because I had put together an actual, um, you know, compensation packages that was based on commission. And he was pretty adamant that, and, and, and I was thankful that he was, um, that we didn't really feel like that was the best model for us in terms of capturing the quality customers that, that I want. Uh, you know, I, I, all of you people out there have, have either had customers or have you worked with people that, you know, turned out to be more hassle than, than what they were worth. So I wanted him to feel like that he could actually turn people away if he felt like uh, it was not a good fit for, for what we wanted to do and, or, or the type of client that we wanted. So. That just can't happen if you got someone that feels uh, like you're taking food off the table uh, by, you know, by turning someone away. So um, he is on an hourly basis with us. We, um, 
he's happy with it, we're happy with it, and it's something that works for us. And you know, one of the things that I wanted to say before I started the discussion is that you know, I'm just going to talk strictly about what I feel like works for us. I don't feel like this should be gospel to any of you guys, but um, you know, this is stuff that, that fits our model. So, um, you know, conveying a pro value proposition, you know, how do we meet people's goals? And that comes down to um, really having that, that Q&A session with our potential clients about um, what are their goals? What, what do you expect to get out of uh, this installation? Um, and then really, um, once you have those, uh, once you have that information, you can put together something that will meet their goals that's not going to be uh, uh, a problem down the roll, road if there was uh, stuff that was promised to them that, you know, over-promising and under-delivering. Under so um, being clear about that. And then, um, you know, the quality of our products and our services um, and relationships, the, the, the route that we've chosen to go and, and just in terms of uh, operational efficiency um, and, you know, really fitting what we believe to be uh, the best offering for us, uh, keeping our product offering simple. We, we don't bounce back and forth from uh, central inverters to micro inverters to optimizers. We found products that work very well for us, that we're very comfortable working with, that we're very comfortable in their value proposition. Um, and we just stay the course with those. We don't have three or four offerings. We have currently one module offering and one inverter offering. And it makes it simple for our guys when they show up every day. They can use the same set of tools. They know the same product. And it's just very simple for us. And allowing our salesperson to, to speak just to the value of those uh, products and services makes it very simple uh, for our guy, for Brian, when he goes out. So um, I think eventually what's going to happen or what's going to have to happen for us, uh, and this is something that's very fluid and we're coming to, grapple, uh, to terms with right now, is that we're eventually going to have to move away um, from a strictly ROI sales model. Uh, we're going to have to uh, formulate new techniques in terms of what values uh, we can sell to people. Um, because uh, I got another slide here somewhere that shows, well, I'll get to that in just a minute. So because of uh, these regulatory challenges that we're facing in Arizona, um, you know, with net metering basically uh, being thrown out the window and going more to a uh, export rate, strictly export rate, credit monthly and credit and debit, um, you know, it's going to create uh, some issues as far as how we sell these things to people. So the new export rates uh, basically, and I'm, people have seen this all over, I'm sure, with Nevada and Hawaii. Ours, I think, are a little bit better than those two scenarios. but. Um, you know, it's generally going to create uh, some issues as far as how we, um, how we uh, present a value proposition to, pe to people. So, um, and how do we continue to have the adoption rates that we need to keep people employed? And that's the thing that really uh, I'm, I'm focused on now because these guys are my, you know, my teammates and my brothers. So, um, so we've got some legislative restrictions um, as well that are kind of uh, above and beyond what the Corporation Commission or the Public Utilities Commission has set forth. And these restrictions are even creating more uh, loopholes or, or, or challenges for us to jump through in terms of uh, timeliness, in terms of how we can uh, interconnect these things, the time between application and actual acceptance of it. So it's, um, you know, above and beyond all of the financial issues, we've got these other restrictions that we have to do in terms of uh, financial modeling. This was this, this is a slide, I don't know if you guys can see this, but um, because of these new export rates uh, that are on the horizon, basically what we did is we tried to chart and see what our, what our cost per watt had to be to um, be at a 10-year, a simple 10-year ROI because because of the new uh, export rates having only a 10-year window in terms of the guaranteed rate, 
Um, that's the window that we wanted to see if we could, uh, or we had to uh, do our financial modeling to. So in 2016, um, we were at about a $3.06 per watt install cost to have that 10-year ROI. With the new export rates going into effect later this year, uh, we have to be down to $2.62 a watt installed to have a 10-year ROI. And you can see why we're going to have to kind of move away from strictly pushing ROI as the only driver for this because once you get past the ITC ramp down and you're out into uh, you know, 2022, 2023, you're down into the dollar to a dollar or a dollar 40 to a dollar 50 cent per watt install to, to have those numbers play out. And that's, that's pretty scary. That's a hell of a lot of solar you got to put in to make a, a, a decent living. So we, like I said, this is all kind of fluid and we're trying to figure out what strategies are going to work best for us um, to continue moving forward. So, so I just took a couple things out of the job task analysis for the sales, uh, sales aspect, you know, identifying customer needs. I think I spoke a little bit about that and that we're going to have to ch um, change our design methodology. Um, those uh, numbers that I had up there were based on a 50% self-consumption on site. Uh, and obviously the others being exported at, uh, at a gradually declining rate, about 10% per year starting at seven cents. So do we go, or are we gonna go uh, more towards smaller systems? Um, and how do we design that? If we're making a lot of assumptions about uh, the way that people are using energy, um, it can be, uh, e even in that realm, it's, you know, all those assumptions need to be clearly uh, labeled, thanks, um, on paper so as to not create any misconceptions or c confusion for people. And I think that's one of the toughest things. Um, we were at a, a conference with Boaz in, in New Mexico, and Energy Sage was there sharing some data. And, and one of the, well, the leading driver for customers to not go solar was confusion in the process. It felt like People were uh, throwing all these different metrics at them, and they couldn't decipher which one was true and which one wasn't. And they just said, oh, you know what? I'm just <laughs> not going to deal with this. So, um, you know, coming down to clear assumptions in the design um, and then managing expectations about these modeling, financial modeling changes, you know, it's going to be more difficult for us to get uh, proposals in people's hands if we're going to have to capture interval data from utilities um, so that we can actually see the load of people's houses. And if they don't have that, how do we put forth uh, a financial model that A, we feel good about and is you know, as truthful as possible, but also B, meets the legislative restrictions that we have as far as putting this information out there. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's pretty tricky. Um, so I just wanted to briefly talk about, I think the part where we really excel, and that's in uh, internal and, and external relationships. And internal relationships meaning the bonds that we have, that I have with the people that I work with, and how that uh, drives them uh, towards quality. I mean, they understand because I still go out in the field, uh, you know, a couple times a month, maybe once in the summer because it's hotter than hell. <laughs> um, but I'm out there with these guys, I'm digging trenches with them. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, doing wire management with them. I'm humping modules onto the roof with them. Only by spending that kind of time with your people, I feel, at least the guys that I have, am I going to be able to really drive that quality uh, to them. They understand what my expectations of myself are, and, uh, and, and, and I think that just kind of leads over. You can, you can stand there and tell people all you want. Hey, I want it done this way. I want it done this way. I really don't think it's that people see that until you're out there uh, burning your hands on hot tools or scuffing your knuckles on, uh, on an LC. So um, that's how I really feel like we convey that. Um, and then external relationships, and I think this is one of the things that I get from um, coming to these conferences as well. But we spent a lot of time um, with our colleagues and our competitors. Uh, about 2010, 
we started to see a lot of influx of uh, outside com competition from California and Phoenix and wherever. Um, we really felt like that the consumers um, were not getting uh, really good products from some of these companies. Um, so we had a group of about six installers in Tucson that got together to share information um, about how we do business. Um, and that was probably the most uh, important process for me in terms of uh, personal growth and professional growth. We, um, you got, you know, we met, the first meeting was at our office. Uh, we're all out there doing battle, uh, you know, trying to get jobs and um, to have your competitors in and share something key about your, the way you're doing things, best practices, whether it be you know, warranties that you're offering or um, your flashing methodologies or your wire management or just simple design. Um, that group um, really, we're all, we all still are, uh, you know, have lunches. We all still talk about uh, policy uh, decisions um, or things that we want to have a call to action for for our clients. Um, so I would encourage any of you guys out there, um, if, I know that trade groups are great. They give you, they make those introductions for you, but really spending some time with the people that uh, you know, we're all out there for a common goal. We want to do so. We want to do as much solar as possible, and we want the best solar out there. And I think if you can get a group, of, a, a group of your colleagues together and share that information, that ultimately, in the end, these people, your clients, are going to get better solar as well as theirs. So. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, you know, again, this is a, such an important program for, uh, for me personally. Um, I'm not sure that we sit at a table and we say NABCEP, we're NABCEP certified if that wins us the job, but I think, um, you know, the overarching um, drive to quality uh, that NABCEP really uh, presents for us, um, you know, I think ultimately uh, our customers get a better, better product for it. So thank you very much. Nice job, sir. So next we have August Gers from Luminalt in San Francisco. Morning, everybody. Um, this is my third uh, NAPSEP conference, and I learned so much coming to these. I've been to. InterSolar and SBI and all kinds of different trainings, but I, I really feel like this is a few days where I get to learn. Um, I sit at the table from people in all kinds of different states, and I think we're, we're all facing a lot of the same challenges, just maybe possibly at different times. And so, um, so I've got a couple slides um, just to talk a little bit about our company. Um, I have some photos here just to sort of illustrate the type of work we do. Um, 2016, we were, uh, I would consider our bread and butter to be residential, but re revenue-wise, we were about 40% commercial and 60% residential. Uh, actually, 2015, we were a little higher commercial. We had some, some big jobs come through. We are about 60% commercial and 40% residential. Um, so yeah, this is a lower right-hand corner. It's a 85 kilowatt um, awning project for a school. Um, prevailing wage, pretty tricky in a lot of aspects. Upper left-hand corner is another residential, um, 50 kilowatt PV uh, with some solar hot water. Um, historically, we had, we had done quite a bit of solar hot water. Um, however, our, our, it became sort of increasingly smaller part of our revenue, and um, we just weren't able to keep staff on board to, to service all our systems, and so we have not been selling new solar hot water systems for the last couple of years. Uh, and then upper, Upper right and lower left are just some residential projects. Um, we do a lot of really small projects, um, as well as some big ones. There's obviously a lot of money in San Francisco, um, so sometimes we tap into that. Um, <clears throat> so our company was founded in 2004 by Noel and Janine Cotter. Actually, Noel's right here in the audience. Uh, and then I joined shortly after. Um, so we're the three owners of the company. Um, and I, I think we have kind of a nice trifecta of, of skills and capabilities that have um, helped us succeed. Uh, Janine's a, a corporate lawyer by background. She's our CEO, um, amazing people person, and you know gives us just, just a great leader. Uh, Noel's really strong industrial and construction background, so 
we, we build a lot of tough projects that the, the companies that are doing leases, like the Sunruns and the Solar Cities, don't want to touch because they don't have that, that payback that, that the lease needs. Um, and I'm a mechanical engineer, and so that's my background. Um, and I started off designing and installing. Um, we are San Francisco's market leader. It's pretty small. San Francisco is seven miles by seven miles. Uh, we, we, every year we, we get an intern and we, we try to look at some of the publicly available data, um, interconnections through our utility, which is PG&E. Um, we, we have a Go Solar SF rebate uh, or incentive, and then we can also look at data on, uh, from building permits. And so we were about a little less than 30% uh, of the market in terms of quantity of systems installed last year in 2016. Uh, Solar City was a little over 20, uh, so together we were about 50% of the pie, and then there were about 50 other installers uh, that we compete against. Um, a lot of the big names, obviously, the Sunruns and the Sungevities, um, and then a lot of you know smaller companies, uh, guys in a truck, and that sort of thing. Um, so that gives you a little bit of idea of our market. We we do service uh, Marin County, the, the the larger Bay Area, but most of our work is in the city. Uh, 33 employees, 7 million revenue. Um, we're a Sun Power dealer. We've got the uh, Outstanding Customer Service Excellence uh, Award several times. Um, we do all the all aspects of the project uh, in house, and that was a big decision that we made early on. Uh, we actually got our start subcontracting for real goods, and so they would sell the job and supply us the equipment, and we would go out and install it. And we quickly learned that we could not make money at that, and also that the the customer experience was suboptimal at best. You know, there were delays, there were multiple points of contact. Um, we could not control the overall experience, and so we decided. Um, basically by 2006 we, we were away from real goods and we were doing all of our own projects and that was a transition you know we had to figure out how to sell and how to you know maybe knock on the neighbor's door when we were installing um, and so it was slow at first but that was a big big decision that we made that I think has been um, really important um, and then really importantly just at the bottom here and I think this relates back to this the NABCEP ideals here we're focused and we have a sustained commitment to the highest standards of quality and customer satisfaction. And we try to communicate that to our staff and our employees um, so that when they're making decisions, they think about that, um, that how important it is to make sure that we have happy customers. And that can be really, really tricky. You know, we have very demanding customers or customers that are kind of checked out and then when they do check in, something's not the way they wanted it. So um, we, we always keep that in the back of our mind. Uh, so, so a, a few points here of just consistent focus. Uh, first off, just absolute customer satisfaction. 75% um, of our business still comes from referrals, um, or at least people using online rating systems like, like Yelp or, or you know, the ones you can find in Google Maps. Um, so making sure that we take care of our customers, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more, has been really, um, I think, what's kept us in business. Uh, we don't have anyone on staff doing marketing. So we, we, do, we don't have, we don't do advertising. Um, we, we do believe that, you know, we have to have a web presence. Obviously, everything more and more is going mobile and going towards the web. So uh, we try to keep that up to date. We actually need to do some more of it. But um, uh, yeah, we don't have a marketing team. Um, we also want to focus on technical excellence. And I think that's a differentiator that uh, a lot of us that have stuck around for a while, we know how to install really well, and I'll talk, talk about that more later, whereas some of the other companies that have come and gone, maybe they've been great at marketing. You know, they have, they, they get ads out and they get tons of business coming in, um, but they may not be able to actually install and pull off the project properly. And so, you know, keeping that, that background of technical excellence, coming to conferences like this and staying on top of it, you know, it's what it's all about. Um, and then just continually developing and improving processes um, anytime we get the idea that we're reinventing the wheel, that we're spending a lot of time writing a new email, try to put it into a template, try to have processes drawn up. Um, I'm a big believer in process. Um, I always feel like we need to have more process. Um, and, uh, you know, it can be, it can be hard when, when people just want to get their work done um, to take that time and figure out, you know, what, what should we actually be doing so that when a new person comes on board, they know what to do. 
Um, so I'll tie some of these back here. So, so yeah, on Yelp, we, we've got 46 reviews. Um, 45 of our reviews are five star. And I knock on wood, I just, I can't believe that we just keep managing to get all five star reviews. Uh, we do have one four star review that was actually a, uh, a three star review. And uh, I'll, I'll, when I get back, uh, at the, towards the end here, when I talk about the management, I'll, I'll talk about that four-star review. Um, but um, yeah, so that, that's been good. And so how do we maintain excellence? You know, you can see our, our area here. We have thousands of installs around the Bay Area. Um, it has really been a challenge as we've grown. We're, we're, we've grown slowly, um, but it's been a challenge to, to keep the core values of quality and customer service going. Um, but if you work at it, you can do it. Um, so, Noel and I actually, we, we installed uh, a system, I remember, probably 10 or 12 years ago, and we got in the truck at the end of the day, and, you know, we kind of looked at each other and we said, solar is easy. Like, you put up some Unirac standoffs and throw up some rail, you know, throw up an inverter, do the wire pole, we got this. And we really felt like we had this figured out. And, what, what I've come to believe, I'm, I'm humbled now, 12 years later, by actually the difficulty and the challenges that we all face, you know. There's a tremendous amount of competition. Uh, there's, there's a lot of really smart people coming in and um, coming up with, with new ideas, to ways to sell and ways to install. Um, and, and building a system that's actually going to last for its service life, maybe 25 plus years, is not easy. Uh, we have a, a marine environment, for example, things corrode. Uh, waterproofing and roofing is always challenging, dealing with all the electrical systems. So, um, yeah, I, I, I try to have some humility at this point and realize that that's actually a, a major, major challenge to stay in business, and that's something we have to work at every day. Um, and here's just an example of a system. This is for an architect. Um, we still do a lot of custom systems, so this is a big, fancy racking system that he came up with. Um, and it, it was just a new challenge, and just, just an example. So. Um, so talking about foundation of quality, which once again just ties in directly to what I've learned as it, when I was studying for my NAPSEP. Um, I'm celebrating my, my 10th year being NAPSEP certified, which is pretty cool. Um, first off, you know, the standard in California and probably I would guess ar around the United States as well, uh, we have a 10-year warranty. So um, now that we're, we've been long, around long enough that we're, we're, we've seen our first systems actually be out of warranty, um, 10 years is quite a while um, to build a system to last and to deal with everything that might happen in a 10-year period, especially inverter failures, for example. Um, you need to be charging enough money so that uh, you can deal with that. And, um, you know, one thing is looking at the, you know, I, I keep hearing all these numbers down in the $3 a watt range. I mean, we're still, for residential, we're still most of the time above $5 a watt in San Francisco. Um, and we can charge it. Um, now, we have hard installs, uh, we've got hard, you know, we've got parking tickets, we've got our vans that are stolen, you know, we've got, you know, it, oh, we've got some of the highest, uh, you know, some of the highest pay rates in, in, in probably the United States, so we, we, we do have a higher rate there, but I, um, you know, we tend to be on the more expensive side, and we try to focus on the value, um, I think in the long term when you're looking at a really, really long investment, that the difference in a couple thousand bucks is, is peanuts, it's nothing. Um, so. Some of the quality aspects that we've set up is first, we, we really know that, that setting up strong expectations with a customer on the sales side is, is really, really important. And so we have weekly sales meetings where we have feedback from what's happening in our installs, and we make sure that our sales reps are trained on setting up proper expectations. You know, what are their bills going to look like afterwards? Um, how long is the installation going to take? What's the entire process? It's a long process. Um, we have really, really good contracts, and it's one of those things that I used to roll my eyes at. Um, Janine is like contract, just she's insane with the level of detail, but it, I, I firmly believe that putting in the time to write a clear contract so that the customer really, really understands what they're getting and that it's fair and it's easy to understand and read is really, really important. Um, and so we really put a lot of work into contracts, and um, speaking of growing, I mean, we're just getting to the point now where um, our CEO, Janine, is not actually reading and, and signing every single contract. We now have a team doing that. But that took a long time. You know, that took, took 13 years to get there. Um, <clears throat> materials and equipment, we just spend a lot of time making sure that we select. I mean, I like what Chad said. 
Um, you know, the equipment um, is, is one of the main failure points, clearly with inverters as well. And uh, we spent a lot of time making sure that we're on top of it for, for using the, the equipment that we think is gonna last and perform really well. Um, designs, you know, we've gone from, I, I, I suspect as many of you, being a small company, we, I used to design the system kind of on the fly. You know, we get a permit and we'd figure out what we were doing on the roof. Um, we've really, really transitioned now. We have a really thorough engineering visit after we, we sell the system. Um, we put a lot of time into, we have something we call an engineering pack, which is basically like an instruction document, shows pictures and where we're gonna run everything. Then we have a plan set. Uh, it's pretty thorough, and then a, a bill of materials, which is a list of all the equipment. And uh, I, I do think that that's been probably the number one thing that has helped with our efficiency and our build quality has just been keeping up with that really, really thorough build pack. Um, if we plan properly and we really think through everything from the roof down, um, our installers, you know, they don't have to be rethinking how to install. They know what to do. They can follow the plans. They can trust them. Um, and, and that's been really, really important. Um, tools, software, and hardware. Uh, just like I think all of us know how important it is to have the right, you know, say battery tools and all, everything right in the, in the, in the vans, uh, I do believe it's really, really important to have all the right software tools as well. Um, we're really fortunate that, um, as, whereas 10 years ago there wasn't much available, a lot of stuff done in Excel probably. Um, you know, now we have tools to remotely analyze the roof to help us with our proposals and deal with all the difficult rate schedule uh, analysis, um, to help us with our design. Um, you know, we have CRM, we use Salesforce um, to help keep our customers uh, organized. We also use Google to, to, to do our, um, our scheduling. And it's been really, really fantastic. And so uh, spending a lot of time on the software tools, although the license cost can get pretty hefty, it's been really, really worth it. Um, and then feedback loops, and I'll just talk briefly about that. Um, as we've grown, um, you know, I don't have as direct of a connection with the crews anymore, and, and I'm not out there in the field to help, you know, to help install. And so how do we, um, how do we hear, yet what, what do we do? And, you know, one person said yesterday, what are we? We're a contractor. We're a solar contractor. What we really do is build systems. And so our crews out there, the, it's the most important thing to know how that all happens and how that works. And if something's not working right, um, we need feedback. And it's very easy to, to miss that point, right? Um, that, that separation between the office and the field that, that can so naturally happen. Um, we need to work really, really hard to keep that together. And so we've done a few things. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our project management structure. Uh, we have um, regular meetings now where we have our designer team and our installation team come together and we pick a topic to, to train on. So it could be grounding or it could be you know, tilt racks or whatever kind of topic. And, and we have the designers and the installers actually work together and learn about that. Cool. Um, so a little bit about cases too. Um, I, I, I ran a report on all our, our cases. Um, we have a couple thousand open cases, or not open, sorry, cases now, you know, problems with systems. Um, so we're starting to build up a, a pretty big backlog of installed systems with issues. 93 were due to equipment issues, 93%. And so, and actually about 60% of that was, uh, was monitoring systems. So we were an early adopter of monitoring systems, um, which just are totally problematic, would have Wi-Fi connectivity issues all the time. I'm sure all of you have struggled with monitoring as well. It is getting a lot better, I would like, or I hope that think. Um, and then about 30% inverter failures, um, especially we you know, had some earlier generation microinverters. 7% um, of our cases arise from either an installation error um, or a process or a communication issue. A lot of times it's customers confused. Um, you know, some, some part of their system was turned off and they don't know how to turn it on, that sort of thing. Um, so talking a little bit about management structure. Um, I think all of us, Noel, Jeannie, and I are all real do-it-yourself type people. I'm one of those kind of guys that still, I change my oil in my car, and, um, or at least, not, not all the time, but, but oftentimes. And so uh, it, it has taken a long time and a lot of work to transition from doing everything ourselves, where we're really holding the company up, to um, hiring and delegating. And so, of course, we, we have to take management training ourselves. Um, 
now obviously we have to realize that we can't do everything, um, but what I would say is that starting to build some of these um, little departments up in our company, it's been the biggest positive change to our company that I've seen probably in the last five years. We've, we've had, um, for, for my own personal quality of life, you know, I was managing about 25 people directly, and I just couldn't, um, I, I couldn't take care of them properly. You know, I, I didn't have enough time. I was totally stressed. It was like every day there was a new problem coming up. It was driving me nuts. And so, um, so we've brought managers in, and it's taken time. We've, we've learned the hard way in some, some cases. Um, uh, but there's a, a few things that I've noticed that, that they're able to do better than us, than, than, than us three owners. And first off, they have a real empathy for their team members. So um, our project manager, example, for example, they manage our installers, and they were installers uh, themselves at one time. And so, um, you know, I, I, our crew morale is really, really high right now. Um, they really get each other. You know, they um, they just take care of each other. And so, I think they have that emp empathy, especially when I was managing tw 20 of them or so. It just, you know, I couldn't take care of them. Um, unbiased decision making and, and spending ability. We're, we're all pretty frugal. I'm a fairly frugal spender. Um, I do find that our, our managers can make just you know, project-specific decisions on what we need to buy without me getting so worried about, oh, God, $350 for this drill. I don't know <laughs> if I'm going to spend it, you know. So, um, and then departmental-specific skills, and this is just a big one. Um, you know, we have a director of engineering. His name is Eric. Uh, he's just a way better engineer than I am. He's an engineer, and he takes care of our, you know, our designs, and he takes care of our little design department. We've got three designers. Um, accounting, we've got a small accounting team. Uh, marketing, we have in the past, but right now we do not have anyone in marketing. Uh, project management, we've set up, and I've been pretty happy with it, we've set up so that our project managers not only line up the projects, but they manage the, uh, the crew members as well. So we have 13 crew members right now, uh, and, and the, the project managers each manage half of them. <clears throat> so we have two, two project managers. Um, and then in terms of, uh, and then the last thing, which is, you know, kind of a, a buzzword I've heard around here, is setting up uh, operation and maintenance. So um, we've had in the Bay Area a lot of companies go out of business, and we're getting those calls on taking care of their systems. Um, and then we have our own systems that we're, in particular, inverters or monitoring, you know, needs, needs service. And um, we're setting up an, a little O&M department. So I've got a leader picked out, and we're working in training and getting hired for that. And so um, that's kind of the next thing that we're working on here. Um, lessons learned. So yeah, back to that four-star Yelp review. Um, that was someone, a great crew lead, and uh, a good installer that we promoted a project manager that, that just didn't have the right skill set, didn't have the right capacity uh, to do that job, and um, ultimately didn't plan the project well. We didn't, you know, it was the simple stuff. We didn't clean up properly. There was some metal shavings that went back on their deck, and, you know, the install took a lot longer than they thought. And so that was an eye-opener for us, you know, um, that um, we need to have the right people in place. And I, I heard something the other day that I really, I just want to repeat because I think it's so simple and so, um, so elegant. It's, it's that good people should be providing solutions for you. And it's that basic litmus test that if you have an employee and they're providing solutions, you come in and you're, you're like, wow, you, gotta, you figured this out? Then that's, something's really going right, you know? If, if, if I'm having to spend all my time doing reviews and being more clear on how to set up things, something's not right there. And so, um, you know, that's, those are just a couple of lessons. Um, and I'm getting, I'm already over my time here. I guess, you know, just don't join the race to the bottom. Um, you, you can't stay in business if you're not making enough money to, to, to pay everyone well and to, to pay yourself and then also to be able to service your systems. Just remember 10 years is a long time. Um, and you know, we've dealt with underperforming systems installed by other people, commissioning that was incomplete, lack of customer service responsiveness, shortcuts. Um, and so, yeah, shortcuts, don't do shortcuts. <laughs> um, and yeah, so for us it's been st uh, slow and steady wins the race. Um, I'll skip that slide and uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So now we have Gary Gerber from Sunlight and Power in Berkeley, and he was literally doing solar when I was in diapers. So there's a visual for you. All right, a little, a little information about my company. Um, we are, uh, we, we started in 1976. I founded the company. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer also. Like August, who's gone? Um, 
There are a lot of mechanical engineers, by the way, uh, a lot fewer electrical engineers than, than mechanical engineers, I've noticed, and in my, my own firm at least, and I see a lot of MEs in, in this industry. It's kind of funny. Um, but we, of course, were doing solar thermal back in 76, so, so it made a lot more sense to be an ME in solar at that time. Um, we are mostly uh, commercial now. Uh, we, were, we were probably 95% residential 15 years ago, and we've, we've completely changed that the other way around. We are still doing solar thermal, so um, that's, a, that's a big and actually potentially growing part of our business. Um, we are very engineering heavy in our company, um, as you might imagine. I kind of like to hire engineers. Um, <clears throat> we have 10, and uh, we have some lead APs. We have uh, a NABCEP certified installers. We always have at least eight to 10, uh, and they come and go, so. And then we, uh, we have, as, as August had mentioned, they, they make an effort when they're at their sites, which we were, you know, five, years ago maybe, um, pretty much everything we would install ourselves, we, we try to keep our capacity up that we can install everything we sell. Um, practically speaking though, um, ebbs and flows of business, we do end up, have, have ended up having to develop our subcontracting abilities as well. <clears throat> okay, let's populate this. Um, we are a, a B Corp, or a, we are actually a licensed uh, benefit corp in California. For those who don't know what a benefit corp is, it's a triple bottom line company, um, people, planet, and prosperity instead of just profit. Um, and that's, that's a, that is, infuses throughout our entire company um, and really, uh, really informs everyone who comes to work for us what we're about, part of our, part of our core values. Our core values are <clears throat> integrity, quality, sustainability, teamwork, diversity. <clears throat> um, and also, um, we do, we have been operating a biodiesel, 100% biodiesel, diesel uh, truck fleet uh, for at least 10 years now. Um, and I, I've been driving electric cars since 2000. And we have four EVs in our, in our company as well. <clears throat> We're a very committed community. That shows in our in our the niche that we really fill in the Bay Area. It turns out is the affordable housing uh, multifamily niche. Is, is we I'm not going to say we own it, but we we are a major player in that field in the Bay Area, and that really works well with with our mission and values. Um, we also do a lot of workforce development hiring, and that's particularly challenging because you're getting people who come in with. Not only do they not have a lot of skills, they may have a lot of bad habits that you have to work on as well. Um, but it's, it's something that's needed in, in our view, in our, in our society, so we try to provide that. And we do a lot of biking to work. We usually win in the bike to work a month competition in the Bay Area for companies of <coughs> our, under 250 people. So I'm very proud of that. <clears throat> so it's been mentioned um, several times, NABCEP, equals quality, I think that that's really the word that we most identify with, with NABCEP, uh, professionalism and quality, I would say. Um, and that is a core value of ours. Um, uh, I, I think August just mentioned slow and accurate, something, something like what you just said, you know, beats fast and sloppy in the long run. Um, you know, we, we're not gonna rush through things, we're gonna make sure we get it done right. Um, one of the ways you do that is you create accountability and I'll, I'll talk about our accountability chart in a little bit. Um, and uh, the other piece of it is you've got a great engineering team, use them to help make sure that everything is built right uh, you know, when, you're, when you're checking out uh, from the job. So we are reviewing all the project closeouts through the engineering department. They're very strong um, support to the, to the field. So in our view, the people are the company. Well, in fact, I, I will mention that the people, in fact, are the owners of the company. Uh, Sunlight and Power is in the last stages of converting to an employee stock ownership plan. So although I've been the sole owner for 40 years, that's going to change in a matter of weeks. Um, we've been hiring since probably 2000 uh, 
from a position of uh, attitude trumps aptitude. By that, what I mean by that is we're looking for people who share the core mission and share core values <clears throat> and understand the mission of the company first and foremost. If they're not in alignment with what we're about in the world, <clears throat> they're not gonna, it's not gonna work for them to be working in our company. Um, so uh, we can train people, we can teach people, that's one of the things that NABCEP's all about. We can, we can teach people the skills if, as long as they have the basic intelligence and ability, but if they're not coming in you know, actually expecting to do something good in the world with their work, um, th that you can't teach, really, in, in my opinion. Uh, we're also, we also do a, uh, we've started doing this in the last few years, we do a, a, a personality analysis, uh, very simple, uh, takes about 15 minutes, and we get kind of a readout of what people's uh, personality profile is, <clears throat> and we then match that with a job. So the managers, when we're hiring for a particular job, the managers will define the characteristics through this process that the, the uh, new hire needs to meet, and then we'll match that with their score. And um, we found that to be extremely effective. And it, it, it's amazing how often you think you've got the right person, and then you find out that they do not have the match that you're looking for, and you, you know, we won't hire them in that situation because we know it's not going to work. <clears throat> we always have um, promoted based on performance. We have developed over the years, and it's really interesting uh, hearing Chad and, and, and August talking about the, their development. And I'm thinking back on when we had 10 people and when we had 33 people. and we're, It's the same kind of... Uh, you know, I was experiencing the same things that these gentlemen are going through. So we can have a nice conversation at some point if you want to talk about what your future is. Um, but um, one of the things is defining the skills. Um, we've we've been we've we now have very clear set of guidelines, uh, and one of them, for example, is that if you want to be a crew leader, you have to get you have to get NABCEP certified. For example, in our company. Um, but below that, our, our Staller 1 and 2, they both have a, a clear set of skills that they have to master and prove, and then they move up. Um, we were far less uh, formal about that when we were a smaller company. Being a bigger company is one of the things that allows you to do things like that. We couldn't afford that. We, we couldn't afford a marketing person um, when we were the same size as, as Luminol. It didn't make any sense. Now we do. So. Um, that's one of those things that, that you can look forward to uh, if you don't already do it, which, you know, there's nothing to stop you from doing these things. <clears throat> the accountability chart is something new for us, and um, we're, really, we're really working into developing how it works for us. But essentially, it's, our org chart is, is now an, an accountability chart, and this is a little snip of what it looks like. And as you can see, the description is essentially, the relationships are there, but the accountabilities it don't go linearly. If you are, for example, a crew leader, you have those responsibilities no matter who you're reporting to. Those, those are what you, that is what you are accountable for, and that's what we want people to recognize. Um, so it's, it's a subtle change in how we, we look at our, our org chart, but I, we feel it's going to be effective. <clears throat> So specifically with NABCEP, we, we've really latched on to NABCEP and we, we take advantage of, of what it can offer and what we can offer people to encourage them to, to get certified. We do reward people with a, um, a field people get an automatic $1 an hour raise when they receive their uh, NABCEP certificate. Um, we also pay for ongoing training. <clears throat> We have a budget. Uh, we don't necessarily pay all of it. We pay up to $500 annually um, for people to take their continuing education. Uh, we actually provide that for everyone in the company, but people who, who are NABCEP need to, be, need to get that uh, CE. We also provide our company facilities for, for training, so we'll, we'll make available our, our um, conference rooms and such if people want to sit in on a, on a webinar and that type of thing. 
And then we have actually, um, this has come and gone and it's now coming back. We have what we call internally PV University. So where we actually have our chief of engineering go through a, a pretty stringent set of trainings uh, for folks, they're invited to show up. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know how many people here know Blake, Blake Gleason, but he's fairly well known in the industry and in NABSEP, and he, he's an editor for Solar Pro, and he's our chief of engineering. And so if you have an opportunity to, be, to sit down with Blake and, and get taught you know, the intricacies of your business, of, of your work, that, that's, that's something that's very valuable in our company. <clears throat> For those that saw me yesterday, I apologize. This is exactly the same slide I put up, um, but it is, it's an important slide. Uh, safety is very important, um, but not, to, and, and I made the point here that although it, there's, a, there's certainly a moral imperative to keeping the people that you're responsible for safe, um, there's business reasons to do it as well. <clears throat> so I'm pointing that out. Um, at one point, we had a little flurry of, of accidents that we couldn't quite explain what happened. We actually, we actually had a, our XMOD go up ridiculously high because we had a bunch of people claiming carpal tunnel in our office, of all things. And that drove our experience mod up. Uh, we got that under control, but we, we, we ballooned up to where we had like a 180, which is ridiculously high. Um, you want to be around 100 or less. Um, we've gotten it down now. I think we're down to 111, but it, there's a tail on, on the, on the uh, insurance X mods. People know what I'm talking about. I don't know. But you have a bad year. It lasts for, that shows up for three years. So it takes a long time to get rid of that, that one bad uh, experience mod year. But that's a direct, direct cost of your insurance. In other words, our insurance went up by 80% that year. And, you know, workers' comp insurance is a big expense. So you can save a lot of money by being safe. Um, obviously, lost, not, all, not as much lost time to injuries, and, um, and your time is your most invaluable commodity. The people's time is, is, is what you're selling. And then better morale, people feel better when they feel they're cared for. I do want to talk just briefly about the subcontracting question uh, because I think it relates to quality in the sense that we certainly have had has struggled with uh, keeping the quality up when it's not our own people. When it's our people and we know exactly what to expect and they know what to expect and they know what's going to be on the plans and and they know how we like to do things. Um, that's far easier than bringing in a subcontractor that you've got to sort of train up. Like, this is how we do things. No, we don't do it that way. No, we don't cut those corners. You've got to keep an eye on them. Um, so um, my advice is be careful in bringing in subcontractors. We, we have had to do it, but we, we do it carefully, and we, we really try to Try to work with the same subcontractors uh, multiple times and get to know them and find the people that are good, even if they cost a little bit more, just, just like we cost more, and uh, that's okay if they get the job done right. Okay, and I would say that, that I have seen subcontractors treated very badly, and I've seen subcontractors put out of business by by solar companies, big, big solar companies that decided, well, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to pay uh, because, you, you know, you didn't, didn't finish some small detail. I saw one company up in Sebastopol was driven out of business by, by just late payment. They, they couldn't stay in business long enough to wait. Um, not good. You know, that, that's, that's bad practice in my view and, and um, that company should still be in business because they, they did good work and uh, it was a shame. So, treat your, treat your subcontractors as well. They, their success is yours. Um, I'm at 15 minutes, so I still have a little time left. Um, so we moved from 50, we've actually gone up to 85 people now. We're, that's not in the future, we're there. Um, <clears throat> that was quick. Yeah, it was a big, we had a big growth year last year. 
Um, by the way, one of the things we're doing, because it was a hugely stressful thing for my company, I know other companies are growing very fast as well, but for us at least, we don't want to go through that again. We are, we've made a conscious decision to stop growing our business for a year at least. So this year, it, we're only shooting for the same as last year in terms of our revenues. And uh, we need to, to get our feet under ourselves and figure out, okay, now that we've gone through the stress of hiring all these new people, let's make sure they're all trained and, and they're all you know, getting the job done right and we should make money this year because of that. And when you're growing, it's hard to make money. So what we've done, because we now have this new support for, for a larger overhead, is very carefully I'm adding overhead, and I'm adding a quality assurance specialist. This is someone we've actually rehired that used to work for us and left. Um, and she's awesome. And uh, she's going to start going around and really um, being an extra set of eyes on all our projects. We also have the, a new technical innovation and excellence as a senior, senior position. This is actually Blake's new position. My chief of engineering is going to get a new position. And um, we're very excited about that because he's going to be able to take us to a new level in, in the tech, on the tech side of things. And then our chief superintendent, because we have more support under that person, can spend even more time on safety, which is one of his primary duties. And I just wanted to end with, with some things we have been struggling with, just to, to put it out there, um, that, that these things are on our mind and we're working on them. Um, keeping key people on the site to finish a job, you know, getting jobs finished, and this is, again, what, why we have that, uh, the, the additional people are going to be helping with this, but um, it's so easy to, you've got your job scheduled, you want to be efficient, the crew's ready to move on to the next job, but you didn't quite finish. What do they do? You know, what are you going to do? You're going to have them work an overtime day and be tired the next day. You're going to have them delay the start of the next job. This is always a challenge, especially on large, you know, we're talking about jobs where we might have been out there for a month or two. So finishing up all those last details has been a challenge for us. And, and while also trying to keep the work flowing properly. Um, very important to make sure people take care of themselves on the site. Um, and that's, that's it, it's, it's amazingly hard, even though we, we pound it into people in safety meetings, take your breaks, take extra breaks, they, they don't do it. Unless you actually force them to, it, they just want to get the job done. They, they're, they're dedicated, they like, to, they like the work and they want to just keep working. You gotta, you gotta force them to stop. Um, and the one thing we're just gonna innovate with right now is we're gonna start uh, a process of, uh, they're not really surprise inspections, but our crews are gonna get inspected without notice. They'll be told it's going to happen, but not, but not when. And so we're gonna start showing up on job sites and, and just saying, okay, what's going on here? And make sure that Number one, that, that they're operating safely. Number two, that, that you know, everything's getting done that should get done. So that's a, that's a new innovation that we're just going to try. And that's it. Thanks. Uh, as I mentioned, Keith is the director of engineering at Baker Electric Solar, one of the largest uh, companies in the San Diego area. And um, there are 200 plus people. And uh, the, the philosophy behind quality is going to be similar, right? But the stage of company that they're in means the kinds of choices that are in front of them today might be a little different. So I uh, hope you enjoy this, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Well, first of all, it's, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. Um, as Jeff Spee said in his presentation last night, we're amongst uh, uh, legends and pioneers, and, and this is a pretty unique time and opportunity for all of us. So. It, it really is an honor to um, share, the, share the stage with these gentlemen and for you to uh, um, take the time to come listen to us. Um, it's funny that uh, we talk about Baker as one of the largest players in San Diego County, and we're actually nationally ranked now. Okay, pull this a little closer. Sorry about that. 
So like I said, it's, it's funny that we're considered one of the, the largest players in San Diego County, and we're actually nationally ranked as one of the top installers. Um, yet, I started with Baker seven years ago as um, director of operations, and we had 12 people in our office. Um, so we still look at ourselves as kind of the smaller installer, like many of you are, like, like Chad described. You know, it's, it doesn't seem any different to us, other than we've got a few more policies and procedures in place. We've standardized our operation a little bit. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Some of the things that we've done, um, you know, it's not a magic formula or a secret sauce or anything like that, but it's some of the things that we've done that have enabled us to grow to the level that we have um, as quickly as we have and remain profitable and remain connected to our customers. So Baker is actually an 80-year-old um, Union Electrical contractor. Uh, it's fourth generation, family owned. Uh, Ted Baker is our, our president. Um, we've built our business around um, quality, value, and integrity in everything that we do. Um, you know, the saying is deliver on your commitments and do what is right. Uh, we call it the Baker way of doing things. Um, our experience speaks for itself. We've done 1.4 gigawatts of installed PV. Uh, we've got a 79 plus year track record and um, over 7,000 customers, both residential, commercial, and utility scale customers that we've had the privilege of working for. Um, on the residential side, we've installed 45 megawatts of solar in the last decade, uh, 56 uh, megawatts of commercial, and over 1,300 megawatts of utility scale solar. I guess that does make us one of the bigger players. <laughs> Um, our foundation is really built on the same standard of code uh, uh, conduct and ethics that NABSEP preaches that, you know, we've been successful by doing the right thing for our customers and for our people. We're committed to uh, professionalism, quality and excellence in everything we do. We don't cut corners. Um, we vet all of our materials. We hire only what we believe to be the best people that share our commitment to the same values and ethics. And we train and empower our associates to make the tough, tough decisions and do the right things. Um, when I started seven years ago, I spoke with every single customer, residential customer of ours. Um, we've grown to the point where I can't do that as much, but I know that the people that they're talking to are representing Baker in the way that we're proud of. And, you know, that gives us a lot of comfort as we've grown from a, a small player to a, a larger player. Um, you know, it's, it's ironic. We, we, I come from California, and um, Assemblywoman uh, Lorena Gonzalez is introducing uh, a bill for consumer protection. And as NAPSEP, um, you know, certified installers and individuals, we bring a level of professionalism to the table that our competitors don't necessarily adhere to. And it's pretty sad that we're at a, in a time where um, consumer protection has to be legislated. We should all be out there doing the right things for our customers, educating them, making sure that they know what they're getting into, that they understand you know, where the value proposition is, and, and you know, not being afraid to tell our customers if in fact you know, your electric bill is really just too small to uh, justify the expense and let them make that decision. If, if they want to do it for other reasons, then certainly that's admirable. Um, we certainly remind our customers to ask those probing questions. We empower them with the knowledge and through our sales presentation that they, they'll be able to understand what they're talking about when they talk to other solar um, companies as they come in the door. Let me go back to the slide real quick just to, to give, give you some history of Baker. Um, this is Leroy Baker up here in the, in the top corner here. Um, that's around 19, late 1929, I believe, is when the picture was taken. He's strapping on his uh, hooks or his climbing boots. He was uh, um, the founder of the company. He went to college to become an electrician. He was a lineman in Missoula, Montana, one of four electricians in, in Montana at the time. And uh, you know that's how he started. During the Great Depression, things slowed down in, in Missouri and he moved to uh, San Diego and worked for a company called Dietrich Electric. 
um, for several years and then was able to buy it and convert it to Baker Electric um, in 1938. The contractor's license you see here is uh, Neville Baker's, which was his son's uh, contractor's license. It was issued in 1956, the first year of contracting. Um, so he's pretty, we're pretty proud to be one of the first licensed electrical contractors in the state. And Kent Baker's down here in the 60s. Um, he was the um, uh, president for uh, a number of years after um, his father. And then Ted Baker took over about a decade or so ago. One of the things that we, we do focus on is building a brand, and we call it a people-first approach to building a brand. Like I said, we've got an 80-year history of quality, value, and integrity in everything that we do, um, that we believe sound business decisions are made by hiring the right people. Um, and we believe that customers and associates should always come first and your brand will follow after that. I've got a video, if I can get it to work here, um, that talks a little bit about those qualities. This is, this is Ted Baker, our current um, CEO. Let's see if it'll, let's see if it'll play. Maybe. Not on that screen. Not on that screen. How do I get it? Hmm. Right. Can I get it onto that? Well, and we're not, we don't have sound. We don't have audio. Yeah. Okay, that, that didn't work. Uh, let's see if I can get back. <laughs> we're having technical difficulties again. <laughs> Apologize that. Anyway, it was a video that, it was a little commercial for, for Baker. It shows Ted, um, and he talks a little bit about um, his great-grandfather, grandfather, and father, and how we've, they founded the business, and essentially the values that we just talked about, quality, value, and integrity in everything we do. Um, let me get back to this. Are we not... All right, there we go. So again, it's about hiring the right people, empowering them to make the decisions, and you know, having that faith that you've built and instilled the, the core values uh, necessary uh, for them to have that moral compass and make the right decision for and the customer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's Chad's fault. Though. Yeah. <laughs> so we can stretch again. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh. Use the space bar again, please. Actually, the video might work. No, no, no it's still not going to work. Don't go there. <laughs> Don't go there. Don't try it. Okay. So we'll jump ahead here. Um, the golden rule. It's one of those things, you know, do unto others as you would have done unto you. It's the way that you define success that I think really differentiates the way that you do business from others. Um, you know, we don't necessarily focus on short-term profits. We have been profitable for the last seven years, but we look at the bigger picture, that we've been around for 80 years, we wanna be around for the next 80 years, and to do that, you have to focus on developing relationships, that you have to earn the position with your customers as a trusted advisor, that you know, they can come to you and, and understand that you're not just out for your own best interest, that you're looking out for their interest as well. And by doing that, you can develop a network of customers that become essentially your marketing tool base, that are your referral base. We have nearly 60% of our business is done through referrals, um, and nearly 100% of our customers have referred other people to us. In a business where arguably one of our largest expenses is customer acquisition, um, that foundation really sets you up for success in the future and makes growing your business that much easier. Um, 
we've won the BBB Torch Award, Angie's List Awards, you know, a number of other awards. We're, we're very proud of those things, but we're most proud of the testimonials that we get from our customers that they become raving fans and tell us, you know, what a great experience that this contractor isn't like other contractors that we've dealt with, that they've, you know, pro uh, under promise and over delivered consistently. And that's not something that they see from, from other um, experiences they've had with contractors. Um, we recognize that doing more business does not necessarily make good business or better business. And like I said, we're not afraid to tell a customer if we don't think we can adequately service their needs if they're looking for something outside or their expectations are something outside of our expertise. We're not afraid to refer on to other individuals that might be able to service those needs better. And we're also not afraid to tell the customer that comes in with demands and expectations that are just unrealistic that, you know, we're probably not going to be able to meet those. And there might be someone else that's a little bit better suited towards meeting your needs. Um, it's, you know, setting that expectation with the customer up front and then delivering on it consistently really is what differentiates excellent, excellent quality and excellent customer service. We operate in arguably the most competitive solar market in the industry. We're in uh, San Diego, uh, in SDG&E and SE territories. We've got over 400 um, licensed contracting uh, competitors in our market. We are arguably the largest. Um, we're a union contractor, so our rates are not the cheapest, and we do provide benefits, and we you know, go above and beyond to take care of our associates. Um, but the way that we look at it is our competition isn't necessarily the other guys that are in the room. We're all in for the same reason. We're all in promoting the adoption of renewable energy. Our competition is really the utility, and we, we are confident in our ability to provide better service and a cheaper end product um, that will ultimately serve the customer's needs in the long run. Um, so it's not something, we don't, we don't get involved in a race to the bottom um, like some of our competitors do, competitors do. We differentiate ourselves on quality, value, integrity. We make sure the customers know that, you know, as much as some of the other players might come in and say that you know, you're buying kilowatt hours, it doesn't matter how it's installed, it really does matter how it's installed and what's installed and who's installing it. That you want somebody that's going to be there for you for the long run and that's what we're there to do. You know, we're not, we, we tell customers up front, we're probably not going to be the cheapest guy that comes in the door, but we will provide the best service and we will make sure that you're taken care of no matter what happens. Um, we've, we like to say that we've kind of rewritten the book on a buyer's guide to going solar. It's available on our website. I invite you guys to come, you know, take, ch check it out, take a look at it. We do have the luxury of being a little bit larger and we do have a full marketing department. We create a lot of video content. So, um, you know, there's an opportunity for you guys that are, that are a little bit smaller than us to kind of benchmark what our experience has been and bring that same level of uh, experience to your customer and your markets. Um, like I said, we do feel a, an obligation to make sure that our customers are educated and are making an informed decision. We are facing a, a dramatic change in our market in that uh, net metering 1.0 in California is coming to an end for all um, the IOUs. And sdg &E was the first to hit the net metering cap of 5% of their customer base. We hit it in June of last year. Um, Southern California Edison is our other market that we operated in, operate in, and we're about to time out on the net metering cap in Southern California Edison, which is, it's kind of sad to see that that's the case. We had hoped that we were going to have enough um, adoption of renewable energy that we wouldn't time out, that we'd actually hit the cap. Um, it show, goes to show that as an industry, we haven't done our part to inform customers. Um, we hear from SEE and sdg &E customers all the time. You know, they're not happy with the service that they're provided. They're not happy with the, the charges that they're facing. Yet, so many of their friends and neighbors haven't been inspired enough to take that leap and, you know, don't have the confidence in where we are in the industry to, to you know, make the change to renewable energy. So that's something that we as an industry need to focus on and make sure that uh, um, our customers understand 
the real value and benefit and the long-term um, advantages to renewable energy. Um, I want to share some of the processes that we go through to ensure that we continue to serve our customers in um, the best manner possible. We employ Six Sigma and Lean practices that um, focus on continuous improvement. We try to be forward thinking, looking and acting. Um, we have ongoing um, training for all of our individual, all of our associates on uh, product knowledge, product offerings, our services, our processes. Um, incremental improvements are as important to um, where we are in the industry as game changers. You know, energy storage is one of the things that we see coming in the future um, with time of use billing. That will be a game changer, but you know, the, the minor changes that we've made along the way are, are equally as important. Um, we are not afraid of taking on pilot projects where we work with uh, early adopters on new technologies. We, we set the expectation that, you know, hey, this is a new technology that, you know, we're, we're willing to take that leap and, and guinea pig it if you're willing to do that to make sure that they understand what they're getting into. And we've been pretty successful in that. We've installed power walls and sawn and batteries and working with some of the other um, leading energy storage companies to, to pilot their programs as well. Um, another process that we go through, which we originally went through a couple years ago with uh, SunPower, uh, is called value stream mapping. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or if you can see the uh, screen up here, but essentially what it does, it's a process where, <laughs> it's a process where you um, document all of the processes that um, you go through in, in the, from sales all the way through installation and identify your lead and lag time between jobs as well as you know, how it impacts each of the cross-functional teams. So we did this originally in 2015 and we identified our process, it was about 30 steps and took about four months to go from sales through completion. Um, by looking at that, you know, that just, just doing that on paper itself is a, is a valuable um, tool to help you analyze your business and see where you are. You'll identify areas where there's, you know, waste or processes that could be done congruently that you never really even thought before. It's like it goes from this person to this person to this person to the next person and, and hey, it has to be done, you know, all one step after the next. Well, really you can run some parallel processes and speed things up without costing you or impacting your business. Um, it's just a matter of recognizing and um, accepting that, hey, there are other ways to do this. And we've taken our process, which like I said, took about four months from sales through completion. Uh, we're down to about 45 days from sales through completion. And we have jobs that make it through our process in as little as 12 days at this point, um, if they're with the right permitting agencies and you know the right roof type and that that thing. So, Some externalities there. yeah, a few a few externalities to work through, but it really can help you take your business to that next level. Sure. Um, another program that we put into place, which it's one of those small incremental changes that we talked about, um, is vendor managed inventory. We've um, got a program, we work with a number of different suppliers, um, Baywa included, um, JexPro, CED, UMA, all the, all the big national players. But we've developed relationships with some of them and taken advantage of um, technologies that's available out there. JexPro, for example, does all of our uh, electrical balance of system components. We've dedicated um, this room that you see in the second picture here on the top up here. Um, it's actually a JexPro warehouse within our warehouse. All the equipment in there belongs to JexPro. Um, we use their, their iPad solution called QuickPix um, to manage our process um, as we go through. So what we've done, we've set up a system where we've got crates and carts, and we put essentially what is a, a 10 kilowatt, what we deem a 10 kilowatt kit of uh, materials that would be needed to do any um, 10 kilowatt um, solar installation on these crates and carts. We load them into our trailers. We send them out to the job along with the panels and the inverter and the other components. And um, when that trailer comes back, anything that needs to get replenished back to these 
um, carts and crates is essentially inventoried to that job and replenished through the quick pick system automatically, uh, built to the job. We actually don't pay for the material until after the job is complete. So it's been a great uh, benefit to us as far as cash flow and freeing, um, freeing up some of our cash. So it's just these kind of things, thinking a little bit outside of the box and doing things a little bit differently that as a small installer, you know, hey, maybe you're running to the supply house every day to pick things up. Well, have those conversations with them and see if you can work out something. And maybe this is an opportunity for you to um, take advantage of some of those um, benefits. Um, this fasten all um, picture down here is also, that's our tool room. Um, it's all of our consumables like sunscreen, uh, eye protection, masks, all the drill bits, saw blades, those things that were very difficult to keep track of um, on a cost basis. Um, now we've got them in a, in a vending machine environment where the foreman actually has a code. He can come in and log in, take whatever he needs for his job. It gets coded automatically to the job so we keep, keep track of those consumables. Um, this is our warehouse. Um, we've got it broken up into two different areas. We've got this picture over here is basically our, our dead storage area where it's all of our modules that we store. The, the center picture is our working inventory. So we've got uh, st separate stations set up for different uh, activities. Um, you know, our kits come together with, with, our, with our crates and our um, carts. We pull the modules that we need, it, the inverters we need it, and everything goes onto a trailer and we're ready to deploy in a matter of minutes where it used to take a full day to put together a job. So. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go through really quickly, um, highlight some of the operational efforts to align the organization, organization and business practices. Um, sales training, we make sure that our guys are, are very technically trained. They're able to answer questions when customers have them. They're not afraid to tell customers that they don't know. Like I said, we don't want to promise something that we can't deliver on. So they're, they're not afraid to tell the customer, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll get back to you. And they do right away, and the customer oftentimes appreciates that more than being told something that's not accurate. Um, simplification, we've, we've taken our contract from what was a 10-page, very legal ease written contract down to a completely consumer-friendly version that uh, has eliminated a lot of red lines from customers that we ultimately ended up signing off on anyway. Now it's very uncommon to see anybody ask anything or red line anything that's not in our contract because it is so consumer friendly. Um, it helps, you know, give them confidence that, hey, I'm dealing with an upfront co uh, company here that's not trying to hide behind loopholes and, and ways around things. Um, we talked about reducing our product SKUs and variability. It helps our salespeople know exactly what they're selling. Everybody becomes more familiar with what we're dealing with. It's less product and, and um, variability for the warehouse, make sure that our uh, kits go out accurately. It helps us reduce our costs by streamlining um, the number of, of SKUs carried, as well as making sure that um, we have the right buying power with the, uh, the major uh, companies that we deal with. You know, we've, we've standardized on quick mount PV, um, properly flashing our, our penetrations or double flashing our, our tile plant penetrations years ago. Um, and we, we use that as one of the selling uh, benefits and features of going with Baker, that it's going to be done the right way the first time. Um, it's also helped us reduce our uh, inventory management and handling expenses. Um, we've identified and uh, documented standard operating procedures so that anyone in the company can log into our CRM, we use Salesforce, and you can see where a job is. You see a status that it's in. We know exactly where it is. We can tell the customer, you know, hey, your job's here. You're going here next. We'll be on site on this date. All that information is stored in a, in a central repository. Um, it's like I said, that's helped us reduce our overall cycle time, and ultimately, it has helped us increase customer satisfaction. That you know, it's not a mystery. It's not I don't know what's going on with my project. It's anyone that I talk to at Baker Electric can tell me exactly where my job is in the project, and if they tell me they're going to be there on the tenth, they're going to be there on the tenth. Um, it makes for a great customer experience. 
And that's it. There's my contact information. Um, if you have any questions, I'd Thanks, be happy Keith. to have you. Nice job. And yeah, I would say if you want to talk more with any of these people about their business and what they've learned and how it might apply for you, hit them up right after the panel too, get their business card. Or you can reach them through me if they didn't bring cards. Um, so let's open it up to questions. Uh, right here in the front. Uh, this question's for Keith. Uh, Keith, San Diego is, a, like you said, a very competitive market. It's a market that's sometimes described as being saturated. Um, I'm amazed when I, when I talk to my friends and family that live there. Uh, they've all been touched by a solar company in one way or the other. And many of them describe that experience as being overwhelmingly uh, negative. Uh, whether they've been, you know, had somebody knock on their door uninvited or been chased down the aisles of a Home Depot with somebody in a green shirt. Uh, so given that 60% of your business referrals, the other 40% of your business, how do you, how do you recommend you know, generating good quality leads and especially particularly converting people um, who have had a negative experience in the past with a solar company that's not following the code of ethics. Yeah. Well, is this one on? Yep. All right. Um, it's tough. I mean, we're, we are in a very highly competitive market. Um, the majority of the customers that we meet with have met with somewhere between five and seven other companies before they decide to go solar. Um, we're fairly fortunate that we have a uh, conversion rate of around 40%, which is fairly high for um, the, the industry. Um, reaching those customers that are not referral customers is one of our biggest challenges. We do have a full marketing team. We spend a lot of money on commercials, on the radio, on TV, and other places. But um, really, our, our business, our core business comes through those referrals. Um, I mean, I don't know that we have any more secret uh, you know, recipe to, to to gaining those customer access to those customers than anybody else, we've tried th third-party referral sources, not with much luck. You know, we've tried direct marketing, we tried mailers, we tried everything you can think of out there, and all of them have a limited amount of success, and they do bring in some business, um, but it, it is one of the biggest challenges in the industry, I think, and that's why our acquisition costs are as high as they are. I, w I would just add to that. <laughs> um, so we actually benefit tremendously from the guys in the green shirts running down the aisles um, because they may have a bad experience uh, with that person or that company or, or a couple others, but um, a lot of them it's really piqued their interest to get a talk uh, or get in front of someone who is local. And um, you know, SEO stuff just drives people uh, fortunately, to our website, and when we finally get in front of them, uh, you know, having someone genuine that really understands the product um, and its and its values, uh, uh, I think, uh, is is big. You know, people are like, oh, well, now I've finally gotten uh, a real truthful look at it instead of uh, you know, car salesman or someone. <laughs> yeah. I I want to jump on the tackle, too, actually. Um, so. So the customers that are experiencing fatigue, the potential customers that you're talking about, didn't want to buy. And there's something to be said for, you know, we're, we're still in the transition from early adopter to mainstream. And this is the chasm. And these high customer acquisition costs and falling prices and commoditization are indicators that we're attempting to cross that chasm. So I wouldn't try to convert a customer that's experiencing fatigue. They've had it, <laughs> right? There are plenty more um, opportunities to help that transition from adopter to mainstream, and then those guys come back. Because then everybody's just doing solar, and that's not that far off, it, my two cents. This is also for Keith. So you've heard, this is a great panel because there's little guys like me and there's big, you know, installers. So you've heard these other three gentlemen's stories kind of coming up from where they've come to or whatever. And, uh, you know, you obviously come from a great big electrical contracting firm. What, 
what I really enjoyed about your presentation were some of the specific uh, operational things that you put in place to make it fast. You know, and I'm not going to sign up for uh, Six Sigma or whatever. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for most of these people. Uh, but could you, knowing what you know from them and what you've heard from them and what you've talked to other people in the industry, could you lay out, could you further expound upon like what practices you think might help small companies, you know, sub 50 employees that, that could help you know, streamline them. Sure. Yeah, it's not, it's not hard for me to imagine that because it wasn't long ago that we were, you know, 12 people in, in a room doing exactly what most of you are doing. And I probably sat in the audience and thought the same thing that you're thinking. And, you know, don't limit yourself saying we're never going to get to that Six Sigma level because I didn't imagine it seven years ago either. It was like, hey, we got to keep the doors open. we got to keep Things, things rolling, um, leads coming in, customers happy, um, you know, all the challenges that you guys face on a daily basis. We now just have a few more people that are able to help us do that, which allow us to focus on those other things. Um, but the, essentially the, the items that we've you know, put into formalized processes were all there in their infancy stages early on. You know, we focused on quality, we focused on value, um, you know, developing those relationships with our vendors, not being you know, afraid to reach out and ask the difficult questions and become that technology and um, innovation leader in your particular market. You know, think about, you know, what can I do that's gonna, gonna save me money, that's gonna add value to my customer, and what can I eliminate that I'm doing that I don't necessarily need to do? Um, like I said, I mentioned at one point I was dealing with every single one of our customers. I talked to them, through, walked them through, you know, turning their system on, uh, uh, making their monitoring system work for them when it didn't work, um, all those things. And we've just got to, we've grown to the point where we have people that that are able to help us with those things. So I don't have to do all of them, but I try to stay connected, and I still do talk to customers all the time because I think it's one major advantage that you have as a smaller player than a larger player is that you're able to see the entire process from beginning to end. You're able to have that direct communication with your customer and you're able to bring that knowledge that you gain from them, whether it's praise for doing something right or a complaint that, hey, this went wrong. Hey, that's an opportunity that they're presenting to you to take that and fix it and make it right. And you're able, you're much more nimble and able to do that on a, you know, a 10 or 12 man uh, company basis than you are on a 200 person basis. So don't, don't feel like you're disadvantaged that you don't have the same buying power or um, support system that we have when you get larger. There is, there is, you know, a great deal of freedom and a great deal of um, flexibility when you're in your position. So just stay focused on the customer. That's really what I think is the, is the key to success. Um, before the next question, Gary, you said a couple things in your presentation yesterday that relate to that question about find something hard and get good at it. Um, and uh, can you talk a little more about that as well, finding a niche and specializing? Yeah, I think for us, um, keeping, keeping a close eye on your overhead and making sure you don't outgrow your, your company, you know, don't, don't let your overhead outgrow your revenues. Um, so you need, it all is going to be driven in terms of, of getting the resources into your company that you need to do, the, the, to go to the next level, to go to the Six Sigma. It means you've got to drive your sales up, right? You, because that's what's going to support that additional overhead. So what I had talked about yesterday in the other talk was, you know, trying to find a niche, trying to find something you can do really well, something other people don't do at all. For example, prevailing wage work is um, is something that's very threatening to a lot of small companies because it's very complicated. And I'm not recommending that at your size, perhaps, but at some point that that's an example of something that one can start specializing in um, or find. I, I know people out in the valley specialize in, in really getting good at dealing with ag customers or you might find that you can you can kind of get a niche in a particular like if you're in, near a wine country you go to and you start becoming the favorite of all the wine companies or the wineries that type of thing just find something that you feel you can distinguish yourself that might be able to give you that extra edge 
Thanks, Gary. I saw a couple more hands. Please. So really for the entire panel, uh, with your salespeople, I'm curious, do you have anybody who has NAPSEP certification for technical PV sales? And if you do, did that uh, give you an added value? Chad? I personally uh, don't have um, a NAPSEP a PV technical sales. Um, and Brian, you know, my, my new sales guy, uh, obviously doesn't have um, the experience uh, to pull that together. But I certainly looked at it. Um, what I personally felt was that, for me, uh, the installer certification uh, really showed, uh, you know, the ability to get these things uh, installed. And my knowledge, really, uh, that I could convey to the customer was based in that in installation uh, arena. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, having an understanding of rate structures and, um, you know, the values uh, and other values that PV adds to it, uh, that just came along with the experience. But I'm not so sure that it's something that I would push Brian towards. Um, I actually have been having him in the field uh, <laughs> getting tar on his pants and um, really getting an, an understanding of, uh, you know, the dynamics behind putting these things in. I think if you have a, a, an, a, an overall broader scope of how these things go in and not just driven by rates uh, and ROI, that I, I feel like you could be a, a better salesperson that way. Uh, we've had a couple. We don't. We don't have any currently. Um, and I guess I would just say my comment there is that it, we we had a, a, a struggle for years hiring the right sales reps that fit with our culture, um, that knew how to install our product. We do have a real niche market ourselves. You know, San Francisco, especially type, you know, complicated construction projects. Um, I think it's a great thing. Uh, we just haven't had it aligned with with people that worked well at our company plus had that, um, but we are gonna encourage our, our current reps to go for it. I'll just I'll just give one quick oh, comment sorry. on that as well, sorry. Um, we do have several technical, um, NAPSEP technical certified uh, sales professionals, and from an engineering perspective, I believe that they're, they're the best salespeople that we have out there. They bring back products that are sold right, they're, um, you know, we can install to the customer expectations. We don't really have any challenges. We have other guys that are higher volume salespeople that haven't been through that process and aren't as technical. Their jobs tend to have a few more of the little tweaks and changes that go along the way that um, could have been avoided if they had that technical background. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, I'd just like to add to what the panelists are saying about, uh, first of all, quality, not to compromise that. And I think that this, this race to the end to the bottom of what you're talking about, there really is a line there. And I think that each one of the installers can be determining where that line is. So in other words, knowing where their threshold is, where they're going to still be able to provide a good quality of service, the good parts, and then follow up with you know, your, your monitoring service out of that, which then in a lot of ways the industry forgets about that. A lot of part of the favorite team, uh, build a company, build a company, and they truly did not compromise that. Uh, it's really important to make sure that as an industry, we uh, st stand by those standards. Thank you. Just from a, a residential sales perspective, um, as the industry is going from get one quote to get five quotes. Um, how are any advice y'all have as far as um, presenting to the clients? We've always been where I'm in North Carolina, two visit close and, and see the client multiple times. And we're seeing the industry shift to come out with a quote, be it an online software tool or whatever else. Um, anything y'all use and implement successfully, be it software or just sales approach that uh, you can give advice on? I'll just give two quick points. Um, one is, that's why, yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Uh, take care of your customers. Referrals uh, will avoid, hopefully, that five competitor situation, or seven or eight or whatever. Um, 
we, we are now, we, we prepare, quote, for residential uh, prior to the site visit. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of tools out there. We've been using Solar Census, which is an um, online shade tool. And then we use Energy Toolbase for, to prepare our proposals. And um, having a, a, you know, a good guess and a start to something for something for them to look at. And uh, we bring, they bring it out in their iPad and they can actually make adjustments has been really, really helpful for us. Um, whereas we did before, we would go prepare a quote afterwards, email it to them, you know, go out and vi try to drop it off. And, and so having something prepped beforehand has been really helpful. Interesting. Yeah, just on that same lines, we use Aurora as our um, modeling software. So we also show up with a prepared quote showing, you know, we get the information up front. Our sales process, we go through a qualification process with a lead qualifier. Then it gets handed over to a salesperson with all the information that they gathered, gathered. They pull that all together. They do a proposed estimate in Aurora on, on a system size, system location. So we come out and you show them exactly where, we're gonna, where we would propose putting it on uh, their home. But we still go through that investigational process with the customer on site to make sure that we understand, you know, is there going to be an addition to the family? Is somebody going off to college? Are you getting an electric vehicle? All those things that come into play. And then we, we go back and regroup and come back with a final um, representation of what we would what we would present as the best um, system to meet their needs. Thank you. In the back. We've changed over time. Um, we peaked last year at 23 crews. Um, we're down to about a dozen at this point. Um, the ironic thing is that we'll install as many systems. This year we're probably going to install about 2,000 systems. We'll, we'll install as many if not more systems than we did last year. Um, and the way we're able to do that is we've, we've changed some of our practices, um, installation practices, that have expedited our installation. So most of our jobs are a one day, to one to two day uh, installation time frame where just a year or so ago, it was two to three days on, on every job. So um, not all of our crew leaves are NAPSEP certified. They're all union journeyman electrician. So they have that knowledge, electrical knowledge that they bring to the table. Um, but we do have foremen that go in and they check quality on, and they check on every single job to make sure that we have installed to the standards that we've, we've set up. We have, we're, we have the luxury of having someone who is a training in, individual that he indoctrinates all of our uh, union employees when they come in. They learn the basic skills through the union. They come to us and then they're trained on the Baker way. It's like, this is what you were taught you know, through the union and these are the, the levels where we take it to the next, um, next level. Correct. Um, we're, we're not currently an accredited uh, um, installer, but we have thought about that, and it's probably on our roadmap for the future. One last question. I've got a quick one for you. Does anybody have metrics in their business specific to quality? I mean, and I'm sure you guys do this as well. Um, you know, we have a, a detailed photographic checklist mm. uh, as the guys are going through the process. Um, and when the job is finished, it comes back in, and we get basically a Rolodex of photos of the entire installation from start to finish, all the points, obviously rails, wire management, uh, conduit, all that stuff. So. Um, you know, being a smaller company, I see pretty much all of those photos as they come through. Um, and there's been times when we see a photo that doesn't meet my standard or my business partner's standard, and it's go back out and fix it. So 
Um, I think our guys know because we spend a lot of time on the roof with them during this process. But, um, you know, the photographic, uh, you know, trail uh, really helps us kind of keep our eyes on how things are going out there. I'll just add quickly, uh, one thing that we have done is we've done daily reports where we also have photos that the crew send, and um, that's been one of the simplest, easiest things that I didn't think was going to work so well. So we have them, we do Google Photos right from their phone, uh, a, a detail of what they did that day, and we can catch a lot of quality issues mm. in that case. Um, we are setting up some new metrics in our sales force to, to deal with quality, but we're not there yet. Yep. Yeah, we follow similar practices to um, those that you've described. Um, obviously, we have a foreman that goes out and checks every job, so the crew lead and the foreman are involved in that side of it. We do photo documentation you know, for fiduciary, fiduciary reporting responsibilities. We review all those in-house as we go through them to make sure that you know, we're up to our standards and, and we track all of our um, service issues through cases. Sorry. Anyway, can you hear me now? I was I was uh, saying that we do similar practices to the to the those that Chad and, and August uh, um, described. That um, you know we have uh, a foreman that's on site that checks the quality. Um, we also have a crew lead that's you know reporting back any issues that he may have run into. Um, we do photographic documentation of all of our systems so that we have a, a record of what's been in, what's been done, and then we review all those photos when they come through to make sure that we don't see anything that is of concern. And of course, we'll go back out to repair those if we see something. And we track cases on all of our jobs. So if a customer reports an issue, we're aware of it. We can keep track of metrics on where we are. Anything on your end, Gary? Uh, I don't want to just repeat the same things over and over. But um, you did ask about metrics. And I think that we, we missed that point a little bit. Because yep. I've been thinking about it. And I'm, I, it's difficult to come up with quality metrics and how do you measure. Well, and, with, and very challenging question, actually. I with, don't have the answer. Uh, Chad's method that he described, and it sounds like August is similar, um, for, for every X number of photographs that come back, and there, sh there should be a fixed number of photographs per, per job, right? If, if you're photographing the, the roof penetration, the rail, the grounding, et, et cetera, um, you could apply a percentage to that, for example, as a starting point. Um, but yeah. Uh, Quality is, uh, by definition, qualitative, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, num number of mistakes per job or something. I mean, it, you know, I, I don't know where you go with that exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you for attending. Thank you very much to our panelists. Great job. <laughs> <laughs>